Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the WASP conference. My name is Svetlana Samko. I am a volunteer in the WASP community, Agile Technical Project Manager in Verizon Connect, Developer Advocate, Advocate and Mentor for Meme and Tech, Web Development Mentor with a passion for security, data science, and AI. And I'll be moderating this session today. During the next 45 minutes, you will be listening to the session Making ASVS Truly Your Own by Luis Servin. Please submit your questions. You can submit them during the session in the QA tab. Uh, just write of this video in the HUA uh, application, in the HUA uh, platform. And I will be asking Luis uh, your questions in the last 10 minutes uh, of this session. Please note that the chat function in Zoom will not be working for you. So please add your questions in the HUA platform. Luis, uh, welcome. Luis is a, a cybersecurity architect working at one of the leading wind industry OEMs in the world. He studied uh, BS in uh, electrical engineering. He holds a master's degree in information and communication systems. He had almost a decade of experience in software development before he started being a full time cybersecurity expert. Since uh, then, he held for eight years the role of lead information security architect at an automotive company in Germany. He has a passion for building the right system in the right way. By preventing defects and vulnerabilities by, from manifesting and finding them as early as possible. He particularly enjoys doing and teaching threat modeling. And another area of interest uh, of Luis is getting the right requirements when they are needed, for which he has already adapted ASVS twice, once for each of his last employers. Welcome, and please take over the session. Uh, if you could uh, unmute yourself, please, Luis, uh, and we can. <laughs> that's a regular thing in online meetings <laughs> happening all the time. I'm very sorry. I thought I had unmuted before sharing the screen. So again, thank you very much for joining. I'm uh, Luis Servin. I'm very excited to be here with you today. And I would like to, you to answer the polls I made for the, for the presentation. Uh, you can find them on the Hoover app on the right-hand side. I have... Um, I think three or four polls. The idea is to, to see whether we can address this and, and the challenge that you're facing if you're trying to adopt ASBS or for that matter, any compliance topics. So let's get started. Um, ask questions, I'll be uh, happy to answer them. Okay, so um, let's get started. So probably you were at least some of you in the presentation from um, Josh uh, Crossman um, just before my talk. So I suppose I don't have to give a very deep introduction into what ASBS is, the Application Security Verification Standard, but still I I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through that one. Then on how you can adopt and transform ASVS to serve your needs. And once we catch a hold of that, maybe how you could make compliance meet the demands of agile development by improving the way we create policies, how we serve them, and how we verify compliance, all on how we create and adapt the ASPS. So I hope you enjoyed the ride. Let's get started. So the Application Security Verification Standard is an OWASP project, one of the flagship projects. It's an application security standard for web applications, web services, web anything. And there are a few sibling projects, if you want. There's one for mobile applications. There's one for IoT. There's one for containers, even. There's a, there's a few projects in the same venue, which could be interesting to, to also consider, because this has a laser focus on web applications. But if you're containerizing your application, you also need to focus on container best practices, right? So it couldn't hurt to, to also look at the other verification standard uh, documents out there. And the best thing is this project was created to make sure that it addresses all OWASP step 10 exploits at what they call level one. So we'll, we'll discuss that in a, in a while. <clears throat> the idea behind ASVS is that you can use it as a measuring stick. So you can say, okay, this is how much trust I can put on your system that you're trying to sell me. 
how much trust I can put on the system that you're developing and asking me to put in production based on the confidentiality, integrity, availability of the data or any other value that is uh, for, important for your business, safety even. You can use it as guidance. So, hey, dear developer, are you developing uh, an API? Hey, could you please take a look at chapter 14 uh, or 13, I think. Uh, in, during procurement, hey, you're trying to sell me this shiny, fancy thing. Which of these requirements do you comply? How much trust can I put on your um, on your system that you're trying to sell me? And, and the most important thing here, and which is perhaps a bit absent from um, the ASPS definition of OWASP uh, of the document within the document itself, is that of software assurance. So basically, this measuring stick is trying to give us some assurance that we can use this system for a purpose and that it will function as intended and in as much as possible is free from vulnerabilities and it provides security capabilities adequate to the threat environment, the business uh, demands that I have, and it will uh, be able to recover or at least alert me about intrusions and failures. So this is the definition of software assurance from uh, Carnegie Mellon. And this has been mapped within ASBS in four levels. So zero, you do what you want, customize it. And then they provide you three levels, one, two, and three, very difficult. One being, okay, you're just starting, get this, get everyone to do this, and you will at least be doing your due diligence. If you have something that is more exposed or more uh, relevant in, in I don't know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, data privacy, whatever, then go for level two. And you have something that takes people to the moon, go for level three, right? So, so these are the levels of assurance that you need for, for, for um, dealing with software. And ASBS allows you in the different levels to touch on the, uh, the whole DevOps cycle. So uh, Dev, Ops, configuring deployment and afterwards assurance and verification. So it, it allows you to de demonstrate so what it is uh, covering. So these are all requirements that might be covered. And last slide uh, regarding, a, oh, well, one before last, um, it has 14 chapters. And it touches on a lot of topics that's very important. So architecture, authentication, session management, access control, Validations and initialization and encoding. So probably my, my top three of these are number five, number eight, 12, and 13. So if you ask me, this is the least, the short list of requirements I would give to most of the developers I work with, because these are the things they're doing pretty much all the time. And how it looks like, it's like this, it's a, it's a document written in Markdown, kept in GitHub, translated into multiple formats. And it basically has a section, as we saw, uh, uh, APIs, chapter 13, APIs, section one, generic web service security. And within section one, chapter 13, we have a list of requirements and it basically tells you, okay, these three requirements are suitable for level one, the rest for level two and three, and they map to a CWE. So one thing that, that I find a bit annoying is, okay, what is CWE 116? I don't know it by heart. And the markdown doesn't have a hyperlink, so I cannot go there. So I have to go to CWE, type in, and I thought, okay, well, if I'm in a PDF and I'm watching it, I mean, reading it uh, on my device, I want to click on it and, and go there. So. Those are some of the changes that I have proposed to ASVS. And it all falls within this, this uh, perspective of uh, adopting and transforming ASVS. So this is the time where you should really, really, really uh, answer your polls, answer the polls, because now I'm, I'm gonna start uh, going through the polls. Okay. So let me see the results. So are you, have you tried? Okay, I have 29 responses for trying to adopt. So 21 out of 31, so two thirds, have 
tried or are trying to implement ASPS as the policy or guideline for software development in their company. So you probably are daunted by the task. So where do I start? What do I take? How, how can I map it, right? So let me tell you my story. 2013, I was sitting in a conference, AppSec conference in Hamburg. Um, and I was just like you in the audience watching, in that case, Jim Manico, or in that instance, I was watching Jim Manico talk about the ASPS and the, the whole passion that he brings when he talks about it, because he likes it even more than the always top 10. So I was like really impressed by it. And I looked for it and some years passed by. <laughs> And then the CISO of the time at the company I used to work for in the past says, hey, I need a list of requirements for software development. And my team starts working on an ad hoc list of whatever they could think of based on their experience. And I'm like, guys, 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 stop, stop, stop. I know the, what we should be doing. Take a look at this one. And, 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 and they were really happy about it. Hey, this is fantastic. It covers everything we need, networking, session management, all the chapters that we have discussed. Hey, let, let's do it. Let's adopt it. But then what happens is you go to your company, you take a document that's not very intimidating, but it's like, I don't know, a few tens of pages, a few dozen pages. And it just doesn't look and feel like the policies you have in your company, right? It's written in a different way. It's made in tables. It has some text, which is not bad, but, but do you want to keep all the text? Do you want to adapt it? Hey, do you want to change the name? That was one thing we wanted to change, right? Because we wanted it to be application secu security requirements guideline, not application security verification guideline. We wanted to use it for development. So you're in, in a puzzle, looking at, oh my God, how am I going to do this? So I need to change the content, which requirements, which controls do I want to keep. Then I need to maybe map it to other policies. Hey, upstream, they're making changes. There's a new release coming up. How do I keep in track with that? The company I used to work for had a, was so fancy that they had their own corporate fonts. So any policy you publish internally in a PDF, has to use this corporate policy, or cor corporate fonts, sorry. So I need to change the fonts. I cannot use Arial or whatever was being used at the time. The structure, hey, does it fit in, in the template of policies that my company has? Maybe not. And the last but not least, okay, if I want to make this a policy, who do I need to talk to and how do I do it? What's the process, right? So these are some of the questions that might be going through your head. So. These are the things that might be troubling you right now. And, and um, I'm not sure if everyone has answered the, the polls, but I, I'll take a look at the, at the polls for uh, process for creating text and uh, of a policy. So basically, if, if you want to see the answer, we can see that some, I'm very surprised that uh, half of the group creates them and maintains them in some sort of uh, source control um, um, software. What I lived in the company I used to work for was word files going back and forth. And if you have ever tried to merge three or four different word files together, you know that's, that's something for bad, uh, when you are very bad boy, right? Or something else, I'm very surprised to see something else. So I, I'm really, Curious to see, to, to understand how anyone would be creating that. Policies without words or, or, or something to keep track of them. So the process is to adopt it relatively straightforward. You go to OWASP ASVS with your account, you fork it, and then you add a second remote to that, that pulls, puts, or uh, points to your internal source code versioning solution, whatever you call it, Bitbucket, GitLab, GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, it doesn't matter, right? So just something that also speaks Git. You can also socialize this repository. So you can change how policies are created within your company 
by making the repository public so that you can get feedback from your constituents. Hey, this requirement is not understandable. And you can even feedback that to the OWASP community, right? Because that's the idea that we improve this uh, standard together. And th then the best thing you could do in, able to be your, in, in order to be able to keep in sync is branch off main and create your own internal branch so that you can keep track of upstream in one and, and your internal changes here and you can then diff or do whatever you need to do. And last but not least, try to keep them in sync, right? So that was the easy part. So I, give me just a second to go to the repository. So if I go to the repository, you can see I have made a couple of, of branches for the purpose of this um, talk. I branch off of master to create uh, OWASP AppSec. All right, so within OWASP AppSec, I'm working right now and I will be modifying the file on the fly with you to see what, uh, how we can adapt it, all right? Which is, I think, the most exciting part. So we have that. Um, now let me move to the next slide. So now we want to adapt the contents. So what do we need to do? We need to edit the content, so the markdown files. We need to edit, remove, add text, change the, the, the flow of the document if you want. But we need to keep whatever we do, a reference to the original to comply with the license, which is CC by SA. So you can use it for commercial purposes. You just need to say, this is derivative work from OWASP ASBS, CC by SA. Uh, then once you have the content, you change the form. So do you need a title page? Do you need a title page with colors, with your logo? Do you need something special in the headers, in the footers? Do you need um, different fonts? This all you can change and then produce the outputs. So you might want JSON, CSV files, Excel sheets, or well, uh, the CSV Excel is probably the same, uh, Word documents, PDFs, XML, all of these are, are applicable, right? So depending on how you're serving your requirements, you might need one or the other. So if, if you haven't yet looked at, at, the, at the repository, I would ask you to, to go take a look at it. Um, the repository looks pretty much like this. So it has all the versions of ASBS all the way to the current one. If you open the folder, EN, you will find the English sources, which are the base sources for the current version. If you look in folder 4.0, you will see that there's also French and Spanish and German and Farsi and I don't know, there's, there's a few other languages there. So in the 5.0 version, it's easy because we only have English. And we will see that the chapters are ordered sequentially. So Look at this, we have a header, which is a YAML file. It's the only non-markdown file. And I'll explain you why in a second. Then we have, okay, this one shouldn't be there. This one has been deleted, but um, don't worry about that. So we have the frontispiece, the header, the preface, and all these matches the document, right? So we have table of contents, and if you look at the document, you will see that it follows the flow. So we have the frontispiece, we have the preface using ASBS, assessment and certification, and then we jump into the requirements, V1 through V14, plus appendixes. It's all there, right? So this is, this is the, re the, the repository structure, this is how where you would be making any any changes and how to adapt it so so let me let me discuss that a, a little bit so you will see we have 
Markdown as the input format. And there's something called Pandoc, which is a universal document or translator, you can call it. So it, it basically looks at something like Markdown, takes some templates from other formats, for example, LaTeX or, or Word, and generates based on that Word, LaTeX, PDF, HTML, and the multitude of formats, right? So this is, this is what Pandoc is being used for. Why Pandoc? I don't know. It was there when I got there. So ASBS is using Pandoc for ages now, and this is what it is. So if you have ever worked with LaTeX, you know it's a pretty frequent thing to work with. It's, uh, it has a lot of dependencies, and it's, uh, you might not have all the dependencies that you need to be able to produce the document, and it takes hours to get everything right. So, so it, it is a nice idea, but then we need a build environment for this. And then there's also a Python stage. So the markdown, the same markdown that we had is parsed through some Python for producing JSON XML. And I think I forgot to include CSV here. So when you look at this together, when you say, hey, I want my, my ASVS, what is it that, that you actually want? So I want my markdown files to be read by Pandoc and I don't care about the environment it is built in. I just want a PDF, a Word, and a, and a, a, a Word file out of it. And I want my JSON, XML, and, and whatever else I want from there. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I just want a PDF. So I don't care how, but just give me that. And this has been made possible through, at least in, in, in the version 5. Version 4 also works, because I did it in version 4 and then made a pull request. There's a, there's a Docker file definition within the repository. This Docker file has everything you need to run Pandoc and Python and LaTeX. So it produces all documents without you having to worry much about it. The only thing you need, the only requirement is Docker or something that can run a container like Docker. I know now that Docker is um, no longer completely open source for, for at least in the Windows version, um, you need a license if you work in a company that has more than, I don't know how many employees or revenue, you might want to look at any of the other alternatives. In the end, it doesn't matter. It's just a container. So take the container, run it in whatever um, containerized environment you have, and it will produce this for you. So how to give ASVS your personal touch? Let's change the title, right? So. This is all metadata. I'm not sure if the font is good enough. So let me, I hope the font is, uh, I didn't think about this before. Sorry, I, I'm not exactly sure how to make the font bigger. Uh, this is VS Code, should be trivial, but uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot change the font right now. I don't want to spend any time on that. So what I want to show you is. Okay, well, this is changed. visible, it's fine. It's, it's visible. visible, thank yeah. you very much for the feedback. Okay, so what have I changed? So remember my, my base document, um, this one here, sorry. So you can see the title, Application Security Verification Standard 5.x, Bleeding Edge Version 2021, and it has the OWASP logo. Okay, so I want to adapt that to my company. So imagine I work for Acme. You know, the, the Roadrunner and the Coyote, acme.com. So Acme Application Security Requirements Policy for Software Development and Acquisition. It's been created in the year 2022. I want it to have a, a logo. I want the logo to be five centimeters in, in width. That's two inches, more or less. And actually, my corporate policy dictates I have to have these backgrounds. Uh, the company I used to work for had one brushed aluminum something background for all their policies to, to make it more elegant. So basically, you can take any one of, of, of these or your own. So if, I, if, you, if you allow me, you can see here, it's, uh, it looks like this. Did it open? It didn't open that one. Or like that. So it's, it's all just the same style, different colors. 
So I can basically just go and say, okay, I want you to take, oh, excuse me. I want you to go and take background number two out of the list. I want to have this unique identifier for the policy on the left-hand side. I want to have the title in the center and I want to have the logo of my company on the right-hand side on the header. I also want you to have the, the page number on the right-hand side uh, on the footer. And you might ask, why do we need Japanese? Because there's one requirement somewhere that has the A symbol for, for kanji. And I think some Hindi symbol as well. That's why we need it. Um, we will be using Deja Vu Sans and Source Sans for uh, code or, or quoted things. So these are the changes that I did. So before even touching the rest of the code, we can try to change that. So how does that work? Again, so I, I changed the, the header and then I need to make a change to the make file because the output has a name. So that cannot be changed here. That has to be changed in the make file. And you will see that in the make file, I have changed the file name, OWASP application security verification blah, 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 to ACME AppSec requirements and left everything as it was. So if, if you have been around development for long enough, you know, make files is how in the past, I would say in the past, uh, for, 10 years ago, uh, maybe still you can do this. You used to download the source code repository version, you clone it, run configured, and then make, and then make install. It's the same thing. So it's a, it's a make instruction that will be run. So let me see if the gods of the demo are with me to show you how to create it. Um, so you will see, I run Docker run, I don't want the container to persist. I want to mount a volume relative to the to the position I am in. So I, I actually want to mount. Uh, so let me let me first change to to the to the version five CD five point zero. I mean this this is something you can change of course in the in the I could have added that, but I'm just lazy. So I add the current directory and mount it inside the container as data. And the container is called ASVS document builder. I named it that way. It doesn't exist in GitHub. You have to build it. And I want the PDF output. So when I do that, it runs a series of transformations on the markdown. Um, you don't have to worry too much about it. One thing that changes is for the PDF, as I said, the CWE becomes a hyperlink. And it is done. So I have created the document. So you will see it transforms to LaTeX. Uh, I am using uh, Excel LaTeX because of the, of the non-ASCII characters. And I'm using a header called Icefoggle. So I'm, I'm using a template called Icefoggle, um, which is great for, for, for LaTeX. So, if I look into the dist directory, you will see that it was created right now. So I'll just copy that to somewhere where I can show it. So give me just a second to show it. Now it is there. So boom, bada boom, I have changed the, the text. I have changed the document. Now you can see it has the title I wanted. It has my, my background for the title page. It has my logo on the front page. It has my logo on the right-hand side, my title, my policy identifier, and the page number. So far so good, right? Now I want to make some changes to the text. So what do we want to change in the text? So let's see, I deleted the whole preface. I don't need the preface because that's great for a general awareness document. I don't need it in a policy. 
Uh, in how to use the document, I basically could say, okay, this policy defines, so you see I changed the text there, functional and non-functional uh, requirements. I then um, changed this because this was overflowing and then I removed the contributors or, or the case studies. Um, and I could keep on doing changes, right? But I mean, this is, this is just what I wanted to change. So because this has been already done, I can show you the output here. And the one thing that I changed that I did not show was at the very beginning. So you can say this is uh, derivative work of, let me make this bigger, of the application security verification standard by OWASP under CC by SA and license under the same term. Now we have the whole using thing and um, and here you would notice if I compare it to the to the first document to the application security development standard that the whole preface is missing, right? So here we have the preface, what's new, and uh, a lot of things. And here I basically don't have any preface, so that I have been able to change it. Now I could be doing this for a long more time, but of course I don't have the time for that anymore. But I hope you get the idea. So you could modify in Markdown. I could modify in Markdown the text as I see fit. So I could do, um, I don't know, validation, sanitization, and encoding. Come on, help me. OK, it's not working like that. It's working like this. Say if I wanted to add here a, a, a column referring to other internal policies, which is something I did. So if I could have here, I don't know, uh, another column policy, boom, and then add basically the same story here. And then here, basically at the end of every line, I could start referring to one put to one, three, whatever, right? Or I could say, I don't know, Paul, no, Paul, one, two, three, four, dot 1.23, I don't know, something like that, right? So I could modify the text here in this way, save it, rerun the, the output, copy it where you can see it, and then, and then you will see uh, that chapter five has this extra column. So these are the kind of things I had to do to adapt it to the company I used to work for, which is something you might have to do on your own. So now let me copy it and then it's ready to be shown. So if I go to, I think, which was it? Was, was it chapter five? If I go to chapter five and I start looking at it, I hope you can see that the policy, I mean, it overflows a little bit, but you can see I have created a link to the policy and I have created a hyperlink from the PDF to the appropriate uh, CWE. So if you see the CWE here, we have the, the matching CWE. So that makes it at least easier in, in my case and for my constituents to understand the document. Um, there are instructions in the repository on how to build a Docker container. Basically, you have to run Docker image build, whatever name you want to give it, Docker, Docker file, go. And then when you run it, it's a command that you show it you, right? So mount the path where the repository is as the slash data. And if you don't pass any parameters, it will build all the formats. If you pass PDF, tech, markdown, word X, something like that, it will create just those. And of course, since this is a container, you could run this in a CI pipeline to create your policy document on demand. And when I started doing this, I, I, I got inspired. And I think I, I, I had a glimpse of what the future of, of policies could be, right? So I think there's more results right now. Um,
So I was asking, how do you check compliance to all policies a system must observe when developed and put into production? And five, uh, five attendees said Excel sheets, uh, 10 said uh, some requirements management software, doors from IBM is one of them as an example. Um, another five said, okay, I don't know, just ad hoc, whatever. And some, some even said, okay, I don't know what compliance even means, right? Um, Another interesting question is, okay, okay, I didn't go to the result, yeah. So how do you go from the policy document to a ticket in your ticketing engine? You call it whatever, Jira, Dev, Azure DevOps, Sports, whatever you want to call it, right? So either copy paste or we don't and we figure out whether we broke something very badly and get an exception or something else, something else being, I don't know, interesting to, to know what that could be, right? Um, and we, we have seen all four questions so far. So that, that's, uh, that, those are the challenges, right? So if we look at, at compliance requirements, so how much time do I have? I have 10 more minutes. So imagine this, you are in a corporation, right? This is you or someone in your company or many, many people in your company, right? And you have a constant stream of guidelines, legal requirements, laws, GDPR, cybersecurity law in China, uh, India. Um, if you're doing critical infrastructure, pretty much all countries have something there and, and you have to mix and match, right? So there might be some people working on, on, on the OT side of, or your company, some people on the IT side, some people on, on data protection office, some people on export controls uh, and they all, have to focus on what is relevant to their domain of knowledge and produce a policy for the company to follow. And this usually ends up in some sort of policy house. It could be a SharePoint, it could be a more structured thing, but it, it, it ends up somewhere. Now, the challenge is me as a developer, me as a project manager, me as, as, as a consumer of these policies, I have to spend a whole day looking for the relevant policies for my use case. And then I have hundreds of pages to go through which ones of those are relevant. And then at the end of it, I have to demonstrate compliance and these same people have to buy it from me. And I might have my customers asking for this demonstration of compliance, external regulators, auditors. It's, it's quite a daunting task, isn't it? And we identify by looking at it three bottlenecks. So the first one is, how do I get the requirements I need when I need them? The second one is, how do I demonstrate that I complied with the, with the requirements, right? And the, fourth, and the third one is, how do these people or, or the auditors here validate the outcome to, be mat to, to match the, the compliance, right? So, so that's, that's a point where I say, okay, maybe we have reached the end of of, of traditional policy and compliance. So we cannot keep on working with PDFs, Excel sheets, and, and questionnaires. That doesn't scale. And even if, if it were to scale, the data there is disjoint from the reality of the development or, uh, or putting something in production, right? Because you're working in, in a ticketing engine, whatever, ServiceNow, Jira, Azure DevOps board, or, or something like that, some, some, some Kanban board of some sort. And, and here, Excel sheets, how did they even match? And then even worse, you do this exercise for one, but then you have five policies to comply with. And guess what? All five want the same requirement. Hey guys, can you at least agree on one? And I just serve you this result. And hey, how do I demonstrate compliance? Well, there are five offices and by, 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 um, What's the law? The, well, I forgot the, the, the guy's name. Um, so if, you, if there are five offices producing policies, you have to produce five different demonstrations of compliance. Everyone wants it in a different way. Some want it in a Word file, some want it in a PDF, some was a form or an Excel sheet. So let's change this. Let's try to do it in a different way. So, hey, I need my requirements and I need them 
Some of them I need for the whole process because they are part of the software development lifecycle, SAS, DAS, uh, vulnerability management, da, 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 da. So there are things that I need to do all along. But there are things I need to do in the scope of a sprint. Hey, I'm doing an API right now. What do I need to take care of? I'm doing a form uh, for the front end. What do I need to take care of? I'm importing files or exporting files or doing something with files with my users or a third party system. What are the requirements I need right now? Not 130 requirements. I need 10 requirements right now for this sprint. And that's why I say, okay, we have just in time requirements and we have long running requirements. And the best thing would be to get these requirements from all my policies, not from ASVS, right? Because ASVS is just one spoke in the, in, the, in the wheel. And then how do we audit this? So how can I do the work once and, and be done with it? And I was just browsing yesterday through, through uh, Twitter, looking at the RSA conference, which was uh, pu um, postponed a few months. So I have five minutes, right? Got yeah, it. yeah, sure, sure. Go I'm going to be good. ready. That's fine. We have a few questions, but uh, that's okay. Don't worry. All good. Thank you. Um, so basically what, what, what the industry is saying, and, and everyone is realizing this, hey, how much effort do we spend in, in auditing to meet compliance? And in the end, we're not even happy with the outcome. We don't consider it to be really a representation of reality. So what could we change? So if you look at the process I just showed you, maybe you have the same idea I had, which is, hey, when we create a policy, why don't we create it as markdown files and store them in GitLab? So there's perfect revisioning of my policy, which is ISO 27001 super compliant. So all my policies follow a structured path to creation, edition, and I can trace back to who made which change when and even have a discussion around it, right? Now, the beauty of it is I can parse it just like I just showed you to produce PDFs that live in whatever cemetery of data we, we decided to put our policies, but there's a more exciting aspect to it. Since I can produce JSON or XML out of it, I can feed a requirement document or, or a requirements gathering system like the security knowledge framework as an example, where I can then go as a customer and say, this is what I'm doing, bam, 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 bam. And I get exactly the requirements that I need. And I get them delivered to where I work. Where do I work? I work in Jira. I work in Azure DevOps Words. I work in, I don't know, help me out, any other project management tool. And I say tickets to them. And the beauty of that is when I close the ticket with a commit, I have a traceability of what security requirement was closed when as part of which story, which then allows me to give a reporting mechanism to these constituents inside the company or these constituents outside of the company. So everyone can know which requirements were met and see that we're compliant. And of course, I'm not the first person to think of this. I mean, if, if there is something very regulated is the federal government in the United States. So NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has come up with something they call OSCAL, the Open Security Controls Assessment Language, which allows you to set to work with XML, JSON, or YAML files to create catalog models. So ASVS would be one catalog. NIST 853 would be another catalog. ISO 27002 would be another catalog. Now, by creating a profile based on whatever is relevant to your company, CIA, whatever, you mix and match. And you say, these rules from this, these catalogs, these many catalogs are the ones I want to have for systems of this type in these characteristics. And that allows you to create a component model and a system model with everything that should be checked. And that allows you to have continuous assessment, which is par part of what the, the American government calls the Fed ramp. Um, so I'm closing in two slides. So keep your policy house, you still need it, but serve your requirements in a way that's friendly to your consumers. And if possibly, ask your consumers what they need and serve them just what they need. 
and integrate with your ticketing API for demonstration of compliance. So I hope it was clear that adopting and adapting ASBS is actually not that hard now that I showed you the path, right? I hope you can follow this path. ASBS is definitely the best practice in the industry. There's no need to create your own. And if your company goes this way, you can change the way your company does policy and compliance and move towards something closer to policy as code. And with that, I'm open for questions. I hope I made a, a one minute of delay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luis. It was very nice, very interesting, very entertaining, and so many questions we got as well. So first question, just um, uh, common one. So would you be able to provide slides for this talk somewhere? Would you like to share um, them? Certainly. I uh, actually haven't. Uh, I think I'll send them to, uh, to the, to the uh, conference organizers, and they will uh, have the slides. So of course, um, the slides are, are there to be shared with everyone. Great, thank you very much. Uh, second question is, given this universal policy format, have you done any work thinking on policy as code? As example, uh, as an input to automated tooling to find violations against policy and for the tool to serve, display the relevant part of the policy on violation, since nobody should be expected to read policy document. Yes, so to answer the question, I that there are, several points here to attack right so the first one is right right here and uh, one, steps one and two so i'm not sure if you're aware iso 27002 just released a new version in february or april this year i'm, I'm not sure either two or four the month two or the month four which is great it's a, it's a very nice policy well not policy standard document so i have adapted that standard document into markdown and I created a parser that reads the markdown and transforms it into JSON and from JSON into an OSCAL catalog compliant format. Now, my intention is to keep on doing this with, with ASBS, so to, create, to be able to create a, a, an OSCALized representation of ASBS so that we can use the OSCAL tools for exactly this. So first of all, first of all serving the requirements based on profiles, and then the, 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 the serving the requirements all the way down to the, to the ticketing system. So if you have them in your ticketing system, you have perfect visibility whether they have been met or not. Now, based on other tooling, you can then corroborate whether the, the, the implementation is correct or not, right? So you have your SAST and your TAST, and with that pen testing, you can check whether they actually meet the standard. I hope that answers the question. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, another question is, how good was the reception of the adoption of the ASVS with your former and current employees? And how much time did it take you to adopt it to the company expectations? So to be honest, it took me quite a while <laughs> to adapt it um, because I had to learn Pandoc. I had to learn, I had to create the, 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 the environment. So I got it running on my machine, mistake. I couldn't replicate it later. So I had to create a Docker container around it. And then I open sourced it. So I, I, I gave it back to the community so that anyone can follow my, my, my trail, right? So if you saw, it, it wasn't too difficult. So the, the thing that was really time consuming was matching all requirements to existing policies somewhere else and pointing to those policies. So that was an effort that we had to do as a team. Um, how much time exactly I couldn't tell, but it was a little bit labor intensive. Now, since Icefogel has been introduced as a template for creating the document and there's a build environment for you to consume, it's really easy. So I, I hope it was clear how easy it is to change the document and adapt it to your own requirements. So it, it shouldn't take you too long. Uh, reception, fantastic. Uh, everyone liked it. In my previous company, they're still using it. Um, it helps when you're threat modeling to ask questions regarding these topics, for example. The first chapter is great for threat modeling. So I always recommended it to the security architects. Um, in the current company, we are using it, but we are using it in a, in a derived version. So uh, there's, a, there's another project from the uh, uh, Open Security Summit in which we have translated 
the requirements into Gherkin stories so that they can be adapted to agile working methodology. Um, so the idea is that these Gherkin stories, which include the definition of done, so given something, when this happens, this is the expectation, uh, this, this, this has been uh, created. So the adoption is not as, as great. So we have to basically be holding hands with our developers to, to do that, but we're getting there. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, another question is how to keep your local ASVS direct policy synchronized with upstream? <clears throat> That's not easy. <laughs> it depends a lot on the customization you made, right? So my advice could be to perhaps, uh, uh, I mean, it's not yet there, but I, I, I intend to provide and an, uh, make a pull request for an OSCALized version of the requirements. So in my opinion, the text around it is not as important for your internal policy as the control statements themselves. So if you restrict yourself to the control statements, they don't move around. So they might change the sentence, they might change a word, a comma or something, that can be managed. The, the, the whole text around it, I would just ignore it. So I, I would probably recommend to start looking into OSCAL and that allows you to have uh, a, a unique identifier for the version. So if something changes upstream, then you can have a, a, a change that triggers a, a, a match of your, of your own. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, how to integrate ASVS with other policies? I would go again the OSCAL way. So as, as I mentioned, I would... Um, create different catalog models from all my policies. So basically it's a lot of work upfront, which pays dividends afterwards. So if you can get not only ASBS, but other policies to be created in the same way, you can start creating catalog models. From the catalogs, you can start creating profiles and the profiles already include the requirements from all these joint policies. I haven't found a better way to do this. To this, I mean, you can always point in the table as I showed you to another policy, but that's not as resilient as having it in one um, consistent profile definition. Thank you very much. And I think it's the last question. If nothing will appear, uh, how can I easily find which requirements I would need to observe for my sprint from uh, AS? Yes. I'm not sure if everyone is aware of the security knowledge framework. So I am not related to it in any way. It's another flagship project. So you can access it uh, here on demo security knowledge framework.org. So basically the idea is you could adopt the SKF internally. No, not that one, sorry for that. I'll just get anywhere and I ask requirements and say, okay, what are you doing? A web application? which is the level of trust that you have in this, or you must meet in this application level two. Um, what are you doing? I am, I don't know, a, a validation. I need some validation because I have inputs from users or other systems. So I have a need for input requirement validation. I need sanitization for SSRF or something like that, yes. I need to output user supplied input on the client side. So I'm taking input from the users, storing it in the database and showing it back to the user. And let's say just next for the sake of the presentation. And let's say, okay, this is a new feature. So this is the sprint, sprint uh, 34 and uh, I don't know, form validation. And if this thing works correctly, it, usually does, but sometimes it has. Um, where's the test? Did I, form validation, sprint 234. So here you could see, oh, it's not working correctly. I'm sorry for that. It usually works correctly. I don't know, they made, they made some changes. So basically this one serves you the requirements in a very nice way with links to CWE. It even includes links to other um, projects, I'm not exactly sure why it is 
not working right now, but that's the problem of doing demos live, right? Um, so, so yeah, that, that's one way. That's the best way. Uh, the other way is to have people go through the document. It's not, not, not as nice as just answering three questions and getting a very concise list of requirements based on what you need. Perfect. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, it was a great presentation. So many information, so many different slides, so much information for for attendance. Uh, anything else you would like to add at the end? For our, uh, uh, I think the biggest challenge is, pardon, is here. This is the biggest challenge of them all. Getting the group of people that work on creating policies to work in a different way, far away from Word documents or Excel sheets is perhaps the biggest challenge. But if you can manage that, the future of compliance for your company might be a lot better than it is now. Perfect, perfect <laughs> end of the presentation. Thanks, Luis. Thanks, Emilian. Uh, thank you, uh, and please contact Luis uh, on uh, the platform as well as uh, ask any questions if you have, and he will be able to answer as well. Uh, 